Hi, I'm Lionel Gossman, and I've been asked to respond to a couple of questions about my little book on Thomas Anna. As the title indicates, the book is about Thomas Annan, a professional photographer in Glasgow from the 1850s through the 1880s. Much of it concerns the photographs Annan took of the slums of Glasgow between 1868 and 1871. Generally thought to be the first photographs ever taken of city slums, these photographs have continued to be diversely interpreted down to our own time. Do they expose and denounce the inhuman conditions in which the urban poor lived in rapidly expanding 19th century Glasgow? Or should they be seen as works of art, in which the tall tenements and silvery rivulets of rainwater, or effluent, provide the elements of a beautiful composition? Are photographers in general, even when photographing scenes of horror and inhumanity, ultimately voyeuristic? exploiting the reality they appear to be exposing for their own ultimately artistic ends. At a very simple level, is photography to be regarded as a form of art, like painting, or as a faithful objective rec recorder of reality? Or is its essential function perhaps to capture and fix particular objects at a particular moment of their inevitably transient and ephemeral existence? in short, to counter the effect of time. These are some of the questions raised by Annan's work and discussed in the book. Beyond the slum photographs, however, Annan produced landscapes, portraits, photographs of paintings and architecture, and photographs of major public works. It was as a photographer of paintings, in fact, that he was most admired. Chapters in the book are devoted to each of these activities in order to give as comprehensive an account of Anna's professional career as a short book will allow. In addition, an introductory chapter situates his work in the context of the extraordinary fluorescence of Scottish photography in the 19th century, both professional and amateur, both at home and abroad. Since retiring in 1999 as a teacher of French literature at Princeton University, I've allowed my interests to range widely. In particular, I've developed a keen interest in the visual arts and have written a short book and several articles on the once celebrated German Nazarene artists of the early 19th century, the predecessors of the English Pre-Raphaelites. It was when consulting with Julie Melby, our graphic arts librarian at Princeton, on a related topic, that I noticed Annan's old country houses of the old Glasgow gentry on a shelf in her office. I was surprised and intrigued. I knew of Annan's work on the slums, but I knew nothing of any other work of his. Julie, on her side, was equally surprised that I knew anything at all about Annan, and even more surprised when I informed her that my graduation portrait had been made in the studios of T and R Annan, then still on Sucky Hall Street in Glasgow. I'm talking about 1951. She told me of Princeton's extensive holdings of Annan's extremely rare albums and urged me to write an article for the Princeton University Library Chronicle to acquaint the friends of the library with this little known treasure. As a native Glaswegian, raised and educated in the then still second city of the empire, I could hardly refuse. On the contrary, despite misgivings related to my age and to my formation as a literary scholar, I was excited by the prospect of going home, as it were, to the scenes of my childhood and youth. Soon I was totally hooked. Annan came somehow to stand for everything I love and respect in the Scottish tradition and in particular in the tradition of the industrial west of Scotland, with its once huge world-famous shipbuilding yards and locomotive factories. Technical skill and ingenuity, honest and sound workmanship, absence of all sham and pretentiousness. Thomas Annan 
has led me back to my roots. The answer to that question is a no-brainer. I've made a little pocket money on books I published with university presses, Johns Hopkins, Cambridge, Harvard, Chicago. Fortunately, I didn't write those books to enhance my income. I just always assumed that participating in scholarly research and exchange was part of my job, along with teaching, advising, and mentoring students. So, when publishing in a format that allowed anyone, including people in poor countries with inadequate library facilities, to access one's work for free, when that became an option, I jumped at the opportunity. Since 2009, I've published four books with OpenBookPublishers.com, and it has been a gratifying and stimulating experience working with people who are scholars themselves and totally committed to the scholarly enterprise. In current conditions, young people setting out on their careers are understandably drawn to the established presses. But we older scholars can and should lead the way in promoting what I'm convinced in this age of intense and open communication will soon be the normal mode of scholarly publication.